Hello and welcome to Univara Live. I'm Moya Lady McLean and tonight I have the pleasure of being joined by Helena, aka No Justice MTG on YouTube and Twitch. Helena, hello. Hello as well. It's always good to be back. I'm looking forward to the show as always. We've got a lot to cover. Coming up later tonight, we look further at the accusations from Israel about the UN Refugee Agency in Gaza. And at Labour's business conference today, Shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves has refused to increase corporation tax. Stay tuned for all of that. But first, we'll be looking at efforts to agree a ceasefire in Gaza. Ceasefire negotiations are currently taking place as we speak in Cairo that could see a new deal agreed between Hamas and Israel. According to sources close to the talks, the deal would involve three phases. In the first, Hamas would release Israeli civilian women, elderly and injured hostages, thought to number around 35, at a rate of one person per day. That would make for a truce of between five and six weeks and see the release of between two and 300 Palestinians prisoners from Israeli jails in return. Fighting would then pause for a further week while the parties negotiate the second phase. Now that second phase would see the release of Israeli civilian men and IDF soldiers. And a third phase would involve the return of the bodies of dead hostages to Israel. However, Hamas has also said it will only consider a deal if a permanent ceasefire is agreed. Israel, on the other hand, has said that it has its own red lines. Those include not stopping the war, not withdrawing forces from Gaza and not releasing thousands of Palestinian prisoners. On Wednesday night, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said a deal would not be agreed at, quote, any cost. But it's reported that officials involved in the negotiation have called his comments unhelpful and that Netanyahu may be trying to, quote, make the deal fail. Haretz also cited an Israeli official who said this. The aim of the extremism in Netanyahu's statements in recent days is to encourage Hamas to harden its positions and torpedo the deal. Such a move could allow Israel to continue fighting while holding Hamas responsible for the failure of the talks. Now, to help us pick through the political intricacies of these negotiations, I spoke earlier to Daniel Levy, a former Israeli peace negotiator who is now president of the US Middle East Project. I began by asking him how close he thought we were to seeing a permanent ceasefire. The effort at the moment, and in fact, that's right where the fault line is in these talks around a possible hostage release, prisoner exchange. And the question there is, will the permanent ceasefire be locked in Netanyahu is refusing uh, very openly, vocally, for that to be the case. So he wants to get at least some of the Israelis out, be able to continue the war, not withdraw the forces from the areas that they have occupied and held inside Gaza, also not release uh, significant Palestinian prisoners being held in Israeli jails. That won't all happen. I think the effort is, can you get as much locked in during any pause in order to make it really hard for a return to war, uh, for a return to the kind of assault we're seeing on Gaza. And that's that's the, the wrestling match at the moment. One should, of course, want to see a permanent ceasefire, given the horrors that have been committed, the level of death, destruction, humanitarian suffering. Uh, Netanyahu politically really doesn't want this war to end because he faces the music on the morning after. I also just want to acknowledge that a permanent ceasefire, Israel and the Palestinians are a a state of war. That was true before October the 6th. When you're a hostile occupying army, by definition, you're at war with the people you occupy. You've said recently in interviews that Hamas have to be part of the political conversation going forward. Obviously, Netanyahu and allies say this is out of the question. What's going to happen there? Who's going to actually triumph? Who will we see actually being part of that political conversation if a ceasefire is called? I draw a distinction. I think if we're talking about a return to the meaningless peace processing of the last decades, which is really just about locking in what I think has accurately legally been described as an apartheid reality. You don't need Hamas for that. If we're talking about actually getting to a place 
where political solutions can be seriously grappled with, engaged with, brought forward, where there's a horizon that both Palestinians and Israelis will get beyond the conflict and no security, and Palestinians will have their, their rights and their freedoms, then you are going to need Hamas, you're going to need a, a variety of Palestinian actors. That's the nature of the thing when you have a broad national liberation movement and there are issues inside the Palestinian political ferment, which we may or may not get into. When you have that ranged against uh, an occupying state, you, you can't do it without Hamas. Hamas is not weaker now as, a, as an idea, as a political force. Hamas is stronger now. That's not what happens in history. And we should learn from that. How feasible is it that we are going to get that attempt at robust, meaningful peace that you talk about instead of this meaningless peace process? We're not seeing signs of that so far. All the signs, uh, the latest statements coming out of uh, the US administration, the statements coming out of the government here in the UK, an improved position, I'll acknowledge that. Under, under Cameron, but still what we're seeing in that international mix in what they're trying to bring the regional states into. What we're seeing is a little battle over semantics. Can we call this Palestinian statehood even though it's really a band to stand? What we're not seeing is a grappling with the failures of the past and what drove those failures and the fact that if Israel is dealt with with impunity, and we saw the reactions to the International Court of Justice, for instance, if Israel is not held accountable, if the incentive structure is not changed, if, as we just discussed, one doesn't include Hamas, if one is not talking seriously about the nature of the Palestinian political lived reality on the day after, if one's still placing obstacles in the way of Palestinian political internal unity, then we're not in a serious process with what we're actually seeing, and it's, it's very dangerous. We're seeing an attempt to funnel things, force things back into a refreezing of the pre-October 7th status quo ante, and that can't get you anywhere. What would it take for that grappling to happen, though? What pieces would have to be moved? Because the answer to that question is a lot. Okay, This is why I really hope that a very cruel choice is not placed by the international community, by Israel and its allies in front of the Palestinians. And that cruel choice would be, we can end the killing in Gaza possibly. We can marginalize the Israeli voices calling for eradication, expulsion, ethnic cleansing, a second Nakba. What we're offering you as an alternative is more apartheid, an entrenchment of a system of separate and unequal, which is what is in place. The kind of partition on offer, even if it would be called a state, and Israel is not ready for that, let's be clear, it would be something that does not give Palestinians their rights, their equality. It has no territorial viability. The position now is again being pushed for demilitarization after everything that's just happened now. Uh, Israelis might say the reverse, but to Palestinians, couldn't that be part? It would have no economic viability. It would be this discontiguous blobs of a Bantu stand. That's a cruel choice, but it's also a choice that cannot bring security and stability because it is still premised on an ongoing system of structural violence, which isn't going to deliver for Israelis either, of course, not for Palestinians. So what would it take? I think the key building blocks, Moya, are, first of all, the Palestinian political body needs to be given space to breathe. We, we, we mustn't try and impose kind of technocratic, divorced from politics, divorced from agency and strategy, which is the, the external effort. So first of all, let, and this is for the Palestinians to lead themselves, let's be very clear, but don't place obstacles in that. Secondly, Israelis have to be faced with much clearer choices. Israelis should not be sent the message, you can do whatever you like to the Palestinians and we'll have your back, but we'd rather you gave them a little bit more of something. 
impunity is the handmaiden of experience, I might argue. But this has given Israel all the wrong lessons. The next thing is, I think we have to break the monopoly of those who are so deeply in Israel's corner that they're ineffective as, as mediators, as, 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 as the conveners. So you have to break that American monopoly. I think we've seen the move taken by South Africa. We're seeing a different position in the global South. So that's going to have to be part of the equation. And these are the building blocks. If we can get them in place, things might look different. This is a question that I've wanted to ask for quite a long time because I've seen you speak a lot. Very impressive, obviously. You used to be a peace negotiator for Israel, working within that two-state solution framework. From listening to you, it sounds like your position might have shifted. Where do you stand on the two-state solution now? First of all, compliments on your British capacity for understatement, Moya. Um, So I went through a process which I came out of thinking, this is really hard to compute. The PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, went into, now at a time of weakness, okay, but it went into a process where it accepted not the partition plan, which already, I think, you know, from from a reasonable anti-colonial, let's say, perspective, why would the Palestinians be the fall guys for European anti-Semitism and the horrors visited upon Jewish communities in Europe, reaching that height of the Holocaust? But they accepted not only partition, but also the reality created on the ground by Israel of an Israeli state in 78% of the territory. And they said, okay, we'll have a mini disconnected Palestinian state of 22% of the land, West Bank, Gaza. This isn't going to deliver on the rights of the refugees. We get that as well. It won't deliver on the structural discrimination under which Palestinians live inside Israel. This seemed like something that the Israelis should grab with both arms and go, oh, my God, we're going to get recognition. We're going to you know, get at the Palestinians to accept so much of what Israel has pushed for. And instead, what I witnessed firsthand was this relentless attempt to drive an even harder bargain, to take that position and then nickel and dime it and and insist on more things and more things to basically empty this notion of of Palestinian self-determination being realized in this state of meaning. Now, maybe that wasn't the inevitable way to go. Maybe if Israel's feet had been held more to the fire during that process, maybe if the prime minister at the time, Rabin, hadn't been assassinated and he'd continued to evolve, maybe that wouldn't have been the case. However, that is what happened. Into the political vacuum stepped violence, as there was no progress. The 90s, the early noughties, are punctuated by Palestinian suicide bombings and violence against Israelis, by Israeli state and military violence against the Palestinians. First suicide bombings come after the killing of an armed settler of Palestinians in in the town of Hebron. And so if one kind of steps back and looks at that, it strikes me that the partition that Israel had in mind was a tool for maintaining domination over the Palestinians. It was part of the toolbox of control and violence. That's certainly where we are today. And Prime Minister Netanyahu who has been in power most of the years of the dismantling of the two-state option, has now effectively eviscerated that possibility. If anyone is serious about going back to two states, you don't do that by saying, you know what, we'll announce recognition of a Palestinian state. That doesn't address what are the borders, what are the sanctions if Israel continues to occupy the area you're recognizing. That's a meaningless, to my mind, rhetorical gesture, even if the PLO, Palestinian Authority, in its current incarnation may say, hey, that's great, another symbolic win. It doesn't help. If you wanted to do it, you could do it. Israel has to withdraw. You you make the Palestinian state real, and sovereign, and viable, and then you continue to discuss issues around refugees, truth and reconciliation. That was never part of our negotiating 
lingua franca, by the way, ideas of truth and reconciliation and transitional justice. But the reality on the ground is a one state reality. And while that reality prevails, and probably a more counterintuitive as it sounds, realistic path forward is to say, what are the conditions for ending apartheid and achieving equality in that space? And that means also creating a landing place, not for the regime as it exists today, but for the Israeli Jewish population who are going to stay there just as the Palestinians are going to stay there. Something I think about a lot is, you know, the ICJ ruling, how significant is that both to the Israeli top team, the politicians, but also to the public? Do they know? Do they care? What is their perception of this? These things are osmosized. These things penetrate people's psyche over time. OK, uh, there, there is a very concerted effort. I mean, this is a whole nother story, Moya, but in the Israeli media to try and uh, shield Israelis, not only from the horrific images in Gaza, there's a lot of censorship, there's a lot of self-censorship, I mean, but also to how things are playing out internationally. But I think this is not simple. OK, um, first of all, there's, there's the case itself. Israel is supposed to report back in 30 days. I actually think what South Africa did at the court has already had more impact, certainly on how Israelis are talking about this. And I think they suddenly realized, oh, my God, you can't say that there are no civilians. That's... So, so it doesn't mean that stopped entirely. I think some of what Israel's saying about the morning after, they've had to, to check themselves. Even on the humanitarian access front. I would say what what is done there in the court is more significant than endless whinging and whining and bleating from the Americans and the Brits and others. But, and again, here's where I have to step back, because international law, the court of justice, does not have powers of enforcement. It does not self-enforce. As we're talking right now, consideration is being given at the UN Security Council on how to take this forward. Unfortunately, there's a rather predictable outcome if there's a resolution that says anything meaningful in terms of what the United States will do. But the significance of this is that it has put the missing A word on the table, and that's accountability. And I think people are looking at this and saying, okay, there's a vulnerability here. Mexico and Chile have gone back to the ICC claims of war crimes. More than 24 states, I believe, in another international court of justice case regarding Israel's prolonged occupation, have referenced apartheid in their submissions. The, the significance of challenging Israeli impunity, the causal connection between that and a change in the politics, I don't think can be underestimated. Some people have said that Netanyahu is holding out for a Trump victory. What's your take on that? November's a long time. I think Netanyahu is holding out to still be in power next week, next month. He, this is, I think he is managing this according to maybe fortnightly cycles. You know, can I, can I not lose my coalition? Can I not succumb to, you know, if there's pressure to do a deal on the reads of the hostages? Do I, do I launch a second front uh, in the North versus Hezbollah? How much do I intensify my aggression uh, against the Palestinians in the West Bank? The other thing that I think one has to acknowledge, painful as it may be for, for, for some of us, Biden has not exactly been a challenge to Netanyahu. Okay, the Americans have provided these two thousand pound bombs. The Americans have vetoed at the Security Council. The Americans have basically run cover this Israeli military operation under a Democrat administration. Now, it's true, with far greater opposition from within their own constituency, but not sufficient to have changed the course of action of President Biden himself. And Trump is a bit more fickle. Uh, uh, Trump, of course, did horrendous things on this question, just on this, uh, when he was president. But um, Netanyahu has Biden still largely where he wants him. Is Netanyahu going in the next few weeks or months? It is a fool's game to predict the downfall of Benjamin Netanyahu. But I think we're, we're in last chance saloon. It feels like it 
his popularity. And this is interesting and remarkable because the, the support for the war is very high. There's a lot of cognitive dissonance. So people want the, the hostages out, but they want the war to, but people do not want Netanyahu. His popularity is low. I think Bibiism, the kind of ideology around it, it, has taken far less of a hit. So I think Netanyahu knows when war ends, he's in trouble. That doesn't mean that it's so easy to bring down his coalition. But the, the overwhelming likelihood is that he will not win further election when that happens. And he is, of course, a man in court facing charges at the same time. Finally, let's just quickly look at the British reaction to this. Obviously, David Cameron started talking about a Palestinian state. What does that indicate? Do you think Starmer might also follow that path? Let's step back a moment. The record of the current government, even through its various incarnations of leadership since the British public were last allowed to vote on him, initially, um, has really been bad on this question. Now, there have been degrees of bad, which, as on many other things, reached a, a remarkable high point slash low point under Liz Truss when there was talk of moving the embassy to Jerusalem a la Donald Trump. But the government itself has tried to insulate as much as possible the British-Israeli bilateral relationship from Israel's violations of international law uh, against the Palestinians. Of course, that's at the same time that the UK and other Western governments have been telling us that we are the upholders of international law and the values and the rules-based order and all this uh, as they stood on their um, moral preachy soapbox over Russia and Ukraine. So the government has done a spectacularly bad job and normalized how one works with an Israeli government with the likes of Ben Gavir and Smotrich in it. I think the extent of the hit that the West and the UK are taking and the extent of the horrors and probably where the British public are at has meant that there has been something of a course correction. But let's look at how the UK government responded to the International Court of Justice. They said South Africa was wrong to go there. They said we respect the court, but they're not going to respect the ruling. They've defunded UNRWA. When UNRWA, the, the service organization, Palestinian refugees, a million people taking shelter in, in UNRWA shelters in Gaza right now, they've withdrawn funding over a, an as yet not sufficiently proven Israeli allegation, which UNRWA has immediately acted. In that respect, I would say that, I mean, I've seen David Lammy's statements from, from the last days. And, and David Lamley's statements on the International Court of Justice on UNRWA have actually been important counterpoints to the government's position. What we have not yet seen is something neither from the government nor from the opposition, which really speaks to a change of approach. And I think which, which really speaks to where the British public is at. And I certainly think on the Labour side, we're not seeing enough of uh, a match between where the Labour voting is at, where that constituency is at, and the positions being taken by the leadership, albeit in opposition. The other thing one just has to throw into the mix, if I may, is the, the very uh, pernicious, ugly attempt to pass this boycott bill, this economic activities bill, uh, to criminalise councils and others uh, taking measures that would sanction what's really needed, indeed, which would sanction not just Israeli behaviour, but also other causes, whether it's uh, to do with the arms trade, to do with um, climate change, to with fossil fuels. Um, that was a horrendous piece of legislation, and that was part of the politicization and attempted instrumentalization and weaponization of anti-Semitism across communal relations. And it would be a huge... Now, Labour has voted against. Its arguments haven't been where they should be, um, but it, it has voted against. But Labour must not find itself in a place where having rooted out anti-Semitism and sometimes defined it wrongly in so doing, it is now opening up its ranks to racism against Palestinians, Arabs, anti-Muslim racism. This is not the place you want. That was Daniel Levy speaking to me earlier this afternoon. And that interview happened before some breaking news that we have for you now. Uh, this is being reported from the Jerusalem Post. It's also been reported by the Times of Israel and Al Jazeera Palestine. 
Qatar's foreign ministry has announced that Hamas has given its initial approval to that proposed deal that we talked about that would see hostages freed and fighting in Gaza stop for a period of time. Now, Qatar's foreign ministry also says that Israel has provisionally agreed to this proposal, confirming reports that Jerusalem okayed the deal at negotiations in Paris earlier this week. This part of the statement is still um, not confirmed. Uh, Israel's war cabinet is meeting right now. In the Jerusalem Post report, they say that Channel 13 News quotes a senior Israeli official who denies anything's been approved by Jerusalem. Meanwhile, Channel 12 in Israel says that Israel has yet to receive any formal response from Qatar to the proposed deal. Uh, but a ceasefire framework does seem to be further along in an agreement than it was at this morning. And Benjamin Netanyahu's worst nightmare could be about to pass. Uh, if that ceasefire is agreed, his position is extremely untenable. So we'll keep updating you if there's any more news on a potential ceasefire in Gaza. Fifteen governments, including the US and the UK, have halted funding to the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestinian Refugees, or UNRWA for short. This is the largest humanitarian agency in Gaza, with some 12,000 workers in the Strip. The organisation runs schools, health centres and refugee camps, while also managing the distribution of aid. The decision to suspend funding will shut the agency down by the end of February, according to UN chief Antonio Guterres. And it came on the back of Israel handing over a so-called intelligence dossier, claiming that 12 UNRWA workers were involved in the 7th of October attacks on Israel. It also claims that 10% of the 12,000 UNRWA workers in Gaza are, quote, Hamas or Palestinian Islamic Jihad operatives, while 50% have a first degree relation in Hamas. That means a brother, sister, parent or child. Of course, that would legitimise in Israel's eyes the collective punishment of Palestinians in Gaza. And it comes as absolutely no surprise to anyone that Israel's dossier magically appeared on the same day that the International Court of Justice ordered it to act in order to prevent genocide in Gaza. Now Sky News has taken a closer look at Israel's claims. This is its assessment. The Israeli intelligence documents make several claims that Sky News has not seen proof of, and many of the claims, even if true, do not directly implicate UNRWA. It's good to see a media organisation take on these claims, a job you'd think actual governments would be doing. But Sky seems to be alone in publishing a negative assessment of Israel's claims. Other media outlets appear happy to serve as free Israeli government PR machines, like America's Wall Street Journal, who ran a story with this headline. Intelligence lays out details of UN agencies' staff's links to October 7th attack. Around 10% of Palestinian aid agencies' 12,000 staff in Gaza have links to militants, according to the intelligence dossier. That's right. The Wall Street Journal simply asserted the truth of the dossier in the headline of its news report. And the article raised no concerns about the quality of the intelligence or where it might have come from. But since then, one of the two WSJ journalists who wrote that article has come in for closer scrutiny. It's been revealed that Carrie Keller Lynn is a former IDF soldier pictured here on the right. On the left is Alicia Landes, a former IDF spokesperson. In a now-deleted 2020 interview with ITREC, an organisation that introduces American graduates to Israel, Keller Lynn said this about the IDF and her relationship with Alicia. I went to serve in the military in 2009 and I was living on a kibbutz. It was a big change and it was a bit lonely. Alicia helped turn that around. I lived at her house on weekends and her family adopted me, which is the most Israeli thing possible. We were two American East Coasters who ended up in Israel and Alicia taught me what it is to be Israeli by bringing me into her life. Interesting. Helena, the claim that UN workers were involved in October 7th is huge. It's massive. So why are the likes of the WSJ willing to print it unchallenged? Well, as you say, it was very convenient for this information to come out at the time of the ICJ ruling in terms of creating a secondary narrative with regards to what Israel wants in this conflict. And that 
material incentive for Israel is very similar and almost identical in terms of its Western backers as well. So within our journalism sphere and the political sphere inside most Western nations who've given complete backing to Israel throughout their war up to this point, they are also just as implicated in terms of the ICJ ruling as Israel is. So when you have Western papers and Western journalists out there, like the Wall Street Journal, not actually putting into question the issues of whether or Israel is committing genocide and giving full backing for them up to this point is within their material interest to run these claims that implicate UNRWA and create a secondary narrative to be able to ensure that people don't question their complicity, their continued failure to hold Israel to account up to this point and back their own governments in the form of their own removal of aid to UNRWA. Now, the governments also have material benefits to gain here too. If, for example, the way the United States government has responded by removing all the funding to UNRWA, given that they are one of the biggest backers of the organization in terms of their financial contributions. When, you, when Ash was talking about this on the show on Monday, the main couple of reasons that we talked about were regards to wanting to remove as much funding as possible so that they could make the humanitarian crisis as bad as possible for Israel's interests to maintain their ethnic cleansing interests to try and force there to be this quote-unquote voluntary migration of Palestinians out of the Gaza Strip to be able to settle it later. Now, I don't think the US wants this. What the US does have material interest in is by undermining future peace processes that do indeed have their basis in the sorry, the Palestinian Refugee Rights of Return, UN Resolution 194. The United States has been one of the biggest brokers in terms of the peace process up until this point with between Israel and Palestine throughout the Oslo process, for example, when the big sticking part for all of these peace processes has indeed been Palestinian Refugee Right of Return. Now, just to go over people who weren't watching on Monday, the main sticking point here is that UNRWA are the people who, under Israel's own volition, essentially, have been able to create an endless Palestinian refugee problem for Israel, because they don't just count the refugees that were expelled in the Nakba of 48, they also count the descendants of those refugees too, therefore creating a permanent class of people who would like to return to the homes that they were purged from in the in 1948 during the Nakba. And of course, the United States at no point ever tried to be able to get UN Resolution 194 to pass, because they have an interest in what would be Israel's position as in, as the ethnically Jewish state that they don't want undermined by adhering to refu the Palestinian right of return. So it, is, it would be really poor form for the United States to admit that those problems exist, and hence why they also want to undermine UNRWA in continuing that dynamic in which Palestinian refugee right of return is this continual obstacle to a peace process that they've continually failed to adjudicate on. And of course, it's only going to get worse from here when we have even more refugees created because of this Gaza war, and of course, any that may have to migrate out of the area due to the ongoing humanitarian crisis that all of these Western governments have helped continue to get worse because of their cutting of funding. It's this continual desire to save face and ensure that nobody criticises them for their failure to hold Israel account up to this point. I think that's, you know, bang on the money. Um, and I wonder if you think that the sort of noises we've been hearing out of the US and the UK today, you know, Cameron talking about this Palestinian state that he now supports, um, but Blinken also saying, well, we're reviewing plans of how a Palestinian state could be created. And now this news that's being briefed that Joe Biden might enforce sanctions against Israeli settlers in the West Bank. Is that further part of, uh, you know, saving face operations by the US and the UK so they can carry on administering their rules-based order despite having completely disregarded it for the last, you know, four months? Oh, 100%. I, I absolutely agree with all of the points that you've raised there. It does seem to me, I mean, you, you look at the way in which British politicians have shown essentially scant regards to the international rules-based order, which seems to be the only part of the world that previously was supposed to be having been constrained by that within the global south, are the ones trying to uphold it now. And as that 80-year, that essentially, that 80-year-long paradigm has become weakened to the point that we have it now, there has to be some kind of massive retread of those steps they've taken over the last few months to be able to maintain maintain Western political hegemony globally, which otherwise would be in crisis, should they not indeed try and find a way of making sure that they can in any way not be impugned by the ICJ's potential ruling, which obviously will take some years to come. But people don't forget 
fine. People don't forget if their governments are, have been not only being given impunity for a genocide to, be ha to happen, but also funding and also arming that genocide whilst it happens too. People also don't forget the appearance of dodgy dossiers uh, amid very, very questionable conflicts. Uh, those of us with memories long enough might also remember one from 2001. <sighs> Let's move on to our next part of the story. Over 27,000 Palestinians have now been killed in Gaza. Each one of those was someone's partner, parent, friend, relative. Some 11,000 of those killed have been children, each someone's child. One of those children was 15-year-old Leanne Hamada. She was sheltering from IDF fire in a car with her six-year-old relative Hind when she made a call to the Palestinian Red Crescent for help. This is that call. Hello? Hello, marhaba, Mo. Hello, marhaba. For those listening on the podcast, in that call, Leon tells the Red Crescent that she and her relative are hiding in a car near Israeli tank and that they are firing on them. And the gunfire you hear at the end of that call was the end of Leon's life. She was killed by the IDF, leaving Hind alone in the car. The Red Crescent sent an ambulance to rescue Hind while the little girls stayed on the phone with their staff for over three hours. These are some of the last words Hind spoke to them before they lost contact. Come take me, come take me, says six-year-old Hind over and over, and the operator tries to reassure her that they're coming as quickly as they can. Are you exposed to gunfire, the operator asks. Yes, says Hind, come take me. This is a six-year-old child, alone in a car without anyone to help her, gunfire all around, presumably still with the body, body of her killed relative. And all this happened on Monday night, nearly three days ago. The PRCS has now posted this grim update. 66 hours have passed, and the fate of our colleagues Youssef Zaino and Ahmed al Madun from the PRCS ambulance team who went out to rescue six-year-old Hind is still unknown. We appeal to the international community to assist and intervene to protect civilians and healthcare and humanitarian workers. An awful situation and the missing in Gaza continue to mount up. The UK Labour Party's top team has spent today at their big business summit. Labour leader Keir Starmer and Shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves have been hosting 400 executives at a conference designed to cement them as the party of business. With tickets at £1,000 a head, at the very least, the Labour coffers are £400,000 better off. But funds aren't the only thing being raised. Eyebrows are also being elevated at some of the new pledges being made to business leaders. Rachel Reeves gave her keynote address to the gathered bigwigs today, and she made one particular promise regarding corporation tax. The next Labour government will make the pro-business choice and the pro-growth choice. We will cap the headline rate of corporation tax at its current rate of 25% for the duration of the next parliament. And should our competitiveness come under threat, if necessary, we will act. That means that business can plan today investment projects with the confidence of knowing that their returns will be taxed at a certain rate for the rest of this decade. Yes, that's Rachel Reeves promising that a Labour government will hold corporation tax at 25% for the duration of the next parliament. Why is it? When Labour speaks about funding public services, there's always a caution and the excuse that we can't make promises. We don't know what the financial situation is yet. But when it comes to promising private business things, the pledges are made with the quickness. 
And an example of this came just minutes later. GB News political editor Christopher Hope asked Reeves if she would raise income tax thresholds. This was her answer. The Institute for Fiscal Studies says that by 2027, 2028, a fifth of Britons will be paying higher rate income tax, one in, four, one in four teachers, one in eight nurses, because of what's called fiscal drag. As, Shadow, as Chancellor, will you lift thresholds to stop this happening? So the tax burden is now at the highest it's been in 70 years, and under the most recent forecasts, it's set to go up for each of the next uh, five years. Uh, I've made no secret of the fact that I think that taxes on working people are too high, but I won't make any commitments that are not fully costed and fully funded. And so while I would like taxes on working people to be lower, the most damaging thing you could do is to promise tax cuts that end up crashing financial markets and sending mortgage rates soaring, which is what the Conservatives have done. I will never make that mistake. So she's saying that Labour have costed for a corporation tax cap, but not to ensure working people aren't dragged into higher tax brackets without real terms take home pay actually increasing. Those are some interesting priorities. And it's not the only area where Reeves seems keen to further beef big profits for only a few people. The Shadow Chancellor has now said that Labour will not reinstate the cap on bankers' bonuses. The EU introduced the cap in 2014 as a safety measure against further, re further reckless city speculation after the 2008 financial crisis. Kwasi Kwarteng, the Tory Chancellor who survived only 38 days after nearly causing a run on the Bank of England, pledged to remove the cap. Last October, Rishi Sunak had followed through on lifting it. And back then, Rachel Reeves said this. Today, in the midst of the cost, their cost of living crisis, the Conservatives are scrapping the cap on bankers' bonuses. Tells you everything you need to know about this government. Powerful stuff! But Rachel Reeves has changed her tune. She's now told the BBC that the cap on bankers' bonuses was brought in in the aftermath of the global financial crisis, and that was the right thing to do to rebuild the public finances. But that has gone now, and we don't have any intention of bringing that back. As the Chancellor of the Exchequer, I would want to be a champion of this successful and thriving financial services industry in the UK. If you want to be a champion of a successful and thriving financial services, you shouldn't let it be so corrupted by greed and unrestrained speculation, which is obviously reinforced and encouraged by uncapped bonuses. You would actually make sure that it's a regulated industry or maybe you just want them to further gut this country honestly what is the point why do we have a government when the city is right there and clearly pulling the strings reeves has not gone unchallenged on this new policy though bbc reporter simon jack quizzed her on the u-turn after her speech today two days ago you told us that you had no intention of reinstating a banker's bonus a cap on bankers' bonuses, and yet three months ago you tweeted, today in the midst of cost of living crisis, the government is scrapping a cap on bankers' bonuses. It tells you everything you need to know about this government. How can the people here trust your pledges when you can change your tune about something you seem to care about so much so quickly? So when the government uh, scrapped the bank bonus tax, we didn't feel that that was the right priority in that budget. But what I hear loud and clear from business, that what it will take to get them to invest in Britain is stability. And the last thing we need is more chopping and changing. And the truth is that in financial services, there are a lot more rules and regulations and safeguards in place than there were before the financial crisis. So, for example, banks have to put up, um, um, aside much more capital than they did before 2008. And there are much stronger rules about clawing back bankers' bonuses. So we didn't think it was the right priority. It wouldn't have been my number one priority in that budget. But the chopping and changing has got to end if we're going to give stability to business. And that's why we would not be bringing that back. Do we not need to rebuild the public finances? I don't get it. Why has the situation changed? And how is economic stability achieved via letting a tiny amount of people profit hugely from speculation and wheeler dealing? Because that is what's happening. That's what it is. Is that really the, uh, con the calculation that is driving Rachel Reeves' policy shift? Does she really have a dramatically different understanding of macroeconomics than she did last October? Or, you know, maybe she's just been speaking to a different set of people. Economist Richard Murphy posted this list of those advising Reeves on her financial services policy. That's eight senior executives from commercial investment banks, one Bank of England official, and one single regulator. 
Even Sky's K. Burley thought Reeves's business pledges smelled a bit funny. This was Burley speaking to Shadow Business Secretary Jonathan Reynolds earlier today. To clarify, Labour's happy to cap child benefit but not bankers' bonuses? Well, I would not make that comparison. I because just did. The, the, the point around this is, this is not about limiting... The bankers' bonus policy was never about how much people are paid. It's the structure. So basically, what was previously bonus went into basic pay. So I just want to be clear, this is not about people saying bankers should earn more. That's not our view. But you're capping child benefit, but not bankers' bonuses. Well, Bottom line. Look, there are lots of things in the social security system I would like to see changed. The health of the economy at the minute isn't one that you can make these kind of pledges on because, frankly, the, the, the strain that system is under is too great. What you have to do is what we're doing today, which is how can you grow the British economy? How can you drive up business investment, stronger growth, stronger productivity? How can you make the net zero transition work for working people? All of this requires a strong relationship with the business community. OK, but bankers' bonuses, they're not driving productivity. They're driving that little, tiny, small, insular industry in the city. It's not like they're the ones who are funding industry. If they were funding industry, surely then they'd be making more noise about saving the likes of Tata Steel or, or not going back on the $28 billion they promised for green investment. It doesn't make any sense. Helena, Reeves is trying to woo business, but a Labour cutting off their nose to spite funding the actual policies that the country desperately needs. I mean, it is really jarring to hear Jonathan Reynolds essentially go, well, we love bringing in business to be able to consult on things we definitely will do for them. But when it comes to policies that are going to help, you know, feeding children, oh, well, unfortunately, the financial situation is just not good enough for me to make that pledge right now. It's a really interesting different change in dynamic. I mean, speaking of changes, I've been reading through a lot of Labour campaign materials recently, and they are very clear in they continually use the phrase that Labour has changed. And boy, have they changed. Rachel Reeves going today with the line of being both with a pro-business and pro-worker. Seems suspiciously to me like being pro-Turkey and pro-Christmas to me, but nevertheless. What is interesting though here is that this isn't being done for votes. Uh, Luke Trill, who does focus groups, who was in the segment with Laura Kay on Sunday for the BBC, actually would tweeted out a poll done by his organisation recently, showing that one of the least trusted areas of the country, that also people view as not respecting them as well, is big business specifically, right? They're one of the least trusted people that he had within his group of people used on this poll specifically. So it's not being done to try and pander to voters, which is a different heuristic that we've seen from basically every other position that Labour have taken. They usually just try and change whichever way the wind goes based on what they think will win them votes. But this isn't about votes because there's no votes to be won in going off to the World Economic Forum and swanning around with the Goldman Sachs bankers at Davos. That's not the way that you win over voters in a post-2008 world when these people are very much untrusted by the public. What this is, is an attempt to create links, create links with business and labour. Now, there is part of the business plan they have, which was really, which we covered in the Financial Times, I believe it was yesterday, in this creation of what they described as being a growth committee, right? Which sounds suspiciously Trussian to me, which is going to involve business leaders and union leaders apparently as well. So at least some of the people who should have vested interests in Labour are going to be included in that. But it was interesting that all of these links to all these different people from financial services sector, all these people who are donating to the Labour Party from big business are suddenly potentially going to be involved in Labour policy making. And we know already that they are all they have very close links to whether whether Labour are going to be including them in policy making. Tribune did an interesting article recently called uh, Labour for Sale, which way they uncovered a bunch of links between consultancies, between lobbyists, between big business and the Labour Party. Like at the point which where we have people who are on Labour's NEC who are directors of lobbying firms. We had Alistair Campbell writing a foreword for Portland Consultancy, in which was informing businesses how they could be interacting with the Labour Party, including ways in which that they could help influence policy. Now, I don't know about you, but a quote unquote Labour Party run for the trade union movement by the trade union movement shouldn't be allowing business owners who have direct material opposition to the interests of workers in this country be the ones setting policy for them. That doesn't seem like much of a Labour Party to me, although Labour has changed, as they say. So this may well be a new, new Labour that we're looking for. That's very, pretty much feels like the cash for access scandal of 1998 to me, but that is only speculation, nothing specific on that one. What is interesting, though, is that it's not like they need to do this to get businesses, at least 
informed of what they're doing. During the Corbyn years, John McDonnell was very open that he had taken his plans to business and say, this is what we're doing. Not in a, would you like to influence what we're doing, but this is how you can plan. This is how you can know that things will be stable and that we have a plan without letting them influence how the policy is made. And Matt's our cousin was tweeting out today. Then his time being an advisor, business were interested in knowing what the potential plan for a Corbyn government was. They want, there wasn't this arms like we don't want to listen to business at all, but letting them set policy was a Rubicon they weren't willing to cross. There's one last part I'd like to add to this specifically, which is that one something that's not been covered very much so in the wake of this business conference is one thing I saw in response to Rachel Reeves speaking with regards to what Jeremy Hunt was doing in his own deregulation of the financial services sector post-Brexit. Now, there's two things. There's what they call the Edinburgh reforms, which is a sense of Brexit bonanza deregulation of the financial sector. What happened last time we deregulated the financial sector? Answers on a postcard. But the second thing was solvency too, which is something people might not know about in chat. This is a bunch of regulations from the European Union, which involves talking about the risk management of insurance firms within the European Union ecosystem. Now, now we're outside of the European Union. We're not in, we're not in implicated in solvency to anymore. But what this does mean is that Jeremy Hunt has decided that he wants to reduce the risk margins on insurance firms, which is the amount of capital that they have to have liquid on hand to be able to deal with if they go bust, reducing the requirements of those by up to 60% in some cases. And Rachel Reeves says she completely backs this. And given that we've just come out of a pandemic and we have plenty of potential ecological disasters coming forward with the wake of climate change, may, do you... Do, increasing the risk in insurers specifically seems like completely profligate financial policy. And one last closing point. From 1995 to 2020, wages in real terms amongst workers grew two times. In the financial sector, they grew five times, right? Increasing the financial sector is the co increases the cost of doing business for everybody else in the economy. They benefit at the expense of everybody else. They, sorry, they benefit at the expense of everybody else, not with everybody else, right? This breeds an increase in inequality in this country when you pump up the financial sector in this way. This is not what the Labour Party's values were supposed to be able to prop up. And it's a damning indictment on the current state of the Labour Party that this is what they champion in 2024. I totally agree. And the, <laughs> and I think that's such excellent perceptive analysis that lays it out so comprehensively. Um, and the only thing I have to say is it really does feel like, I don't know if anyone's seen that long, that meme has a very long shelf life now, this Arrested Development meme, uh, where two characters are talking, Helena, uh, not Helena, uh, Lindsay and Tobias, and Lindsay says, but did it work for those people? And Tobias says, no, it never does. They delude themselves into thinking that it will but it might just work for us. And that's the current Labour Party policy when it comes to deregulation. Thank you so much, Helena, for joining me tonight. As always, it is not just a pleasure, but an honour to have you on because your insights are just so good. Thank you very much. Much appreciated. I do appreciate the kind words. And again, it's always a pleasure for me to be here as well. Always good to be back and look forward to the next time. I'm very glad about how much we've expanded the Navara Media family in recent months. And that is due to the support of you guys at home. And thank you so much to all of you for tuning in, as always. Come back tomorrow for another packed show from 6 p.m. You've got Aaron, you've got Michael. You know it's going to be spicy. For now, you have been watching Navara Media. Good night. <laughs>